Hello everyone, I'm Russ Bainbridge with HRS Systems, and I'm going to be covering how you can determine if you need a pump at the beginning of a project or not. Like I said, I work at HRS Systems answering technical questions and developing training material. You can see my background here. I'm a graduate from Oklahoma State as well as Cal Poly, and I sit on several committees currently for SFPE and in the past for NFPA. What we're going to cover here is what you would need to determine if you need a fire pump or not. Because at the beginning of every single project, the first thing that is asked by a project manager is, do I need a fire pump? So let's go over what you need. You need the basic information, and you need to run a few quick calculations, and then we're going to cover some tips on what you need to gather. Main thing you need to know, where is your project located? Then you need a water supply. Either you need to complete the test or you need to get a reliable test. Where your riser is located, your occupancies, and a basic floor plan. The reason why you need to know the location is because of seismic zones. This can adjust your pipe sizing because you can choose pipe sizing to get around seismic bracing. So this will have a, effect, a large effect on your pipe sizes. Then is your site at a high elevation. If you do need a pump, this may, may change the size of pump you need. Also, you might be pumping water uphill, so the location of your pump or what size pump you need will be different depending on the elevation of your site. Then is the area known for poor water supplies. That right away could give you a dead giveaway of whether a pump is probably needed or not. How's the fire department response? This could determine your water supply as well as whether your sprinkler system is heavily going to be relied upon if there is a fire. Like, shown, like I show here, if it's an hour away, your system might have to be more robust. Is the site located in a developed area or developing area? If it's in a developed area, your water supply isn't going to change as much potentially in the future. It can still change, but it won't change as much. Whereas if you're developing in a new area, your water supply could drastically go down as more occupancies and facilities are coming in and drawing more water away from the supply. These all need to be considered when you're looking at potential pump. And then is the site uh, then is your water supply changing over time? If you can get some of that data over years, that's also very helpful, but not very common to be able to get. Then if someone is supplying the water flow test for you, you need to know when it was done, where it was done, what the elevation of the test hydrant is compared to your site. Is it in a city, county, or private water supply? Because these could all change how your water is delivered to your site, and the supply. Is the water supply in a gridded or looped system around your site? Again, this can change how your water supply is provided to your site and whether you can come in from multiple directions. What are the pipe sizes and types of the water supply around your site? If you've got, you know, six inch coming in or a four inch coming in, you know, you're gonna struggle a little bit more with fire pump you can definitely make it work, but uh, some rural areas, if you put a pump on it and it starts sucking, you're going to collapse that main pretty quick. Then is, is the water supply on your site already determined or can you have a say in it? Can you loop it around your site so that your water supply, if something were to happen on your underground, that you'll still have some water as well as the numbers just being better? Are there any pumps or tanks on the water supply already? So if the city has pumps and tank system, you need to gather that data. If the pump was running, what size it is during the test, if there's a tank, having the elevation levels is kind of nice just to know how much pressure it's feeding into that pump. Not absolutely necessary, but it's nice to have. And then is the location of the riser room already determined or will you get to have a say in where it's going? 
if they put the riser room in the back of the building and the underground's coming in at the front, obviously you're going to have to run new underground around to the riser. So that's going to decrease your water supply. Also, again, if you can loop it, then you can put the riser in the best hydraulically demanding place. And then do you get to have a say in the pipe that's being used? So PVC, ductile iron, these things can all help. Again, also size is a major issue. So if you can have a say in all these things, your water supply is going to be better and could help you get around having a pump. But if these are all already determined, you're kind of stuck with the choices that have been made for you. Then what's going to be happening in the building? What's the occupancy? So storage, manufacturing, business. You obviously need to have all those in mind. A lot of times if you have storage, you're automatically going to need a pump almost right out of the gate just because most water supplies aren't able to give those high pressures. And then determine what's the most demanding. So if you have a small storage section and the rest is manufacturing, you know, your, your main area won't be storage. So that won't be driving whether you need a pump or not. Then determine your coverage area per sprinkler. So if you've got a K25 sprinkler, you're obviously going to have different coverage area and pressure demands than if you're doing a 5.6. And again, if you're also doing light occupancy versus high hazard, this is also going to change your water supply requirements. So then you want a basic floor plan. A lot of times at this point in the project, I literally just have an outline of a building. So you might not have a floor plan, but it would be nice to have. Most architects, when they're bringing in fire protection, at this point, they've already basically laid out the occupancies. So you'll have that information to work with and you can determine the hazards and the occupancies at that point and determine where your most demanding area will be. Then you're also gonna to wanna to know where possible fire barriers are or walls to deck to help with determining which area will be most demanding. How many systems you might need. This could change how your calculations are and where you run your piping. And then a quick layout of the most demanding area for calculations. So it would be best to do a quick layout, but I'm going to show you ways to get around actually laying out any sprinklers on the design or on the floor plan so that you can just quickly go through and get an estimation in a few minutes. So here's the floor plan we're going to be working with. So our test hydrant is located at SCR1, which is at the down the bottom left-hand corner. No pump or tank on the water supply. As you can see, it's looped. It's a mixture of 8-inch, 12-inch, and 16-inch ductile iron. And then to keep things simple, we're going to say the test hydrant is at the same elevation as the finished floor. Our flow test data, static 65, residual 55 at 1800 GPM. And then this is something I have run into quite frequently where a building owner doesn't know what's going into the building yet. They're building it and hoping to find a client later. So we're going to say undetermined manufacturing plant, seismic zone, so somewhere like California, so we would need to do seismic bracing. Finished floor elevation of 800 feet, so not a high elevation. It's in a developed area, so we don't need to plan out for future losses. And then we only have the external exterior walls at this point. So since it's a manufacturing facility, it's probably going to have some storage, but it's a very small area, and you'll just have to protect those areas not as a huge EC25 system or in racks. You can just cover it at the ceiling level. So the occupancy would be ordinary hazard group two. We're going to use 8K sprinklers with a coverage of 130. We'll do 120 just so we can allow for adjustment in the field as needed. 
Then our coverage area, 1,500 square feet, density of 0.2, hose stream of 250 altogether, 100 inside, 100 outside, 150 outside. So we quickly calculate how many sprinklers will be needed by taking the size of the design area over the protected area per sprinklers. So 1,500 square feet divided by 120 square feet per sprinkler, that gives us 12.5 sprinklers or 13 sprinklers since you can't have a half a sprinkler. And then we wanna get the total flow for the design area. Again, we're not designing the system, we're just trying to figure out if we need a pump real quick. So we take our density over the coverage area. So 0.2 times 1,500 square feet. That gives us a flow approximately of 300 GPM for the coverage area. Obviously, again, this is just an estimate. The other way to do this is to get the individual flow per sprinkler. So that's the design density over the coverage area. So 0.2 times the 120 square feet gives us 24 GPM. And we know how many sprinklers we have, so we can multiply that flow times the number of sprinklers to get the overall flow. So 24 GPM times 13 sprinklers, 312. So that gives us a little bit better estimate. It's gonna be higher as well. Obviously not much higher, but to me, it just gives me a better estimate. It makes me feel a little bit better inside. So then we want to get our starting pressure, which is obviously our flow out of an individual sprinkler over our K factor squared. So for this example, it's 24 divided by eight squared to give us nine PSI. From there, we use the Hayes and Williams. We're gonna say our branch lines are two inch, schedule 40 black steel. Again, this is a seismic zone, so we didn't want to go over two inch, so we didn't have to brace as much. So again, just normal Hayes and Williams formula. And this is our basic floor plan layout. So the building's 150 by 150. So we'll take the 312 GPM. We'll say it's 75 feet for the branch line. So I took the middle of the building and just went to the cross main on one side, plus five feet for the fittings. Our C factor is 120, our internal diameter 2.157. This gives us a pressure loss of 50.13. So you can see here, this is the absolute worst case scenario. It's all of the design area flowing through one branch line and it's flowing halfway through the branch line. So again, this is worst possible case scenario. Then we're gonna take that, calculate it back to the bottom of the riser. So we have 412, because we included the inside hose. Our main, we're gonna say is four inch, schedule 10 black steel. We also have an elbow, flow switch, check valve, butterfly valve, and elevation change, all included in this one. So it's 412 times the 162, so that's the length of the main, all the way back to the riser location, plus the fittings and the change for elevation. We're at 12 feet, by the way. And then the internal diameter, 4.26. Then we add in the loss for elevation change. So our friction loss would be 9.79. Then our elevation change would be 5.2. So 14.9. So when we add that, to our previous friction loss of 50.13 for a total of 65.12 at this point. So now we're gonna do underground. We're gonna say it's PVC. We got to have a say in the underground. We have elbows, backflow preventer, gate valve, T, and elevation change, plus our 150 for our outside hose stream. So that gives us a total flow of 562 our length for our underground is 395. So that includes all the underground out to the city tap, along with the elbows for going into the backflow, the backflow preventer going down into the underground. 
We're going to say it's six inch. Sorry, that, that's an error up there in the slide. So we're going to use six inch in the calculation. So we have four foot down into the ground plus a four PSI loss for our backflow preventer. So our friction loss for this length of pipe, 3.68, plus our elevation change, 1.73, plus our backflow, four. So that gives us a total pressure loss for the underground of 9.41. Add that to our previous total of 65.12. That gives us 74.35. So our total system demand at this point is six or 562 GPM at 74.53 PSI. Now again, this is an estimate and I tried to go worst case scenario so that we could add more fittings, pressure loss or the pressure demands might change a little bit, our water supply might change a little bit. So we're trying to include several of those things by taking the worst case scenario. So now we need to compare that to our flow data. Again, the static 65, residual 55 at 1800. So to do that, we can put it into an equation or we can graph it out. Normally I would put it in this equation. So QA is your flow available at the demand pressure. So you're gonna need your demand flow which we just calculated, demand pressure, which we just calculated, then use your static and your residual. So that would be 562 times 74.51 PSI minus your static over your static minus your residual to the 0 0.54. So that gives you flow of 547 at 74.51. So this would be the flow available at your demand pressure. Obviously they aren't equal, so you're, you have a problem. So now let's compare our pressures. So our pressure available is what we're trying to achieve here. We have our static, our residual, our flow available at the demand pressure and then our flow demand. So that's 65 PSI minus 65 PSI, which is our static minus our residual at 55, times our flow that we have, and then our flow available. So 562 over 547 to the 1.85. So that gives us 61.48 PSI at our required flow of 562. So the demand is 13.03 PSI more than the supply. So a pump would be needed. So here's the graph. See here, it's well above our water supply curve. So now I'm gonna quickly go over how you can do this faster and easier in Haas. So here's our Haas 2020. You would start by going to a new grid, give it a title. Then we're gonna say since it's 150 by 150 that we'd have 13 branch lines. We're gonna do 10 feet between the branch lines. Uh, we're going to say our length is 140, so that gives us 5 feet on either side. We'll do a nipple of 1 inch, or 1 foot, sorry. Then distance between branch lines will go 12 feet, because we're doing 120. Overall coverage area, density requirement, 0.2. Area of demand, so this is your overall demand, so that was 1,500. Our area multiplier of 1.2 from NFPA 13. K factor of eight. And then this length is the whole length of your main 
starting from the far end of your grid, so your first branch line, all the way back to the riser. So that would be, we're going to say 145. Elevation of sprinklers, we had it at 12 feet. Branch lines, we'll keep them at 12 feet as well. Cross main, drop it down to 11. Then our source we had at negative four. No sprinklers at the cross main. Separate branch line at riser nipples, no. Then we need to enter our static information. So that was 65, residual, 55, flow, 1800. We're going to do a hose stream of 250 for our total hose stream. We won't include a fire pump. The next you can see here, Haas has calculated out our branch line sizes. How many are to the, the left side of the cross main? Right side. Then you can see here our volume, pressure drop. Most demanding sprinkler, that's our required pressure. So our estimated flow, I wasn't very far off. So 330 versus our 312. Sprinkler velocity or water velocity, pressure required at source, pressure available at source. How many branch lines we're calculating? How many sprinklers per branch line? How many pipes are in the grid? How many nodes were used? And then the ending nodes. So here's all that data that we entered. Then you can verify here again, the data that it's using to calculate. See here, it also calculated out 13 sprinklers, 3.87 per branch line, so four per branch line. Then it gives you an item breakdown and then we supply this little graph here so you can verify that everything looks good so there's our sprinklers right there connecting to our cross mains there's an actual graphical layout so you can see here all 13 sprinklers where they are on the branch lines Next, save your project. Not going to calculate the cost for this one. We go over here and we scroll up. You can see the system's all laid out. After this, you do need to connect your source to the system. So we're going to add a line. We'll do 39. 40. So this source, we would include all our flow data from the riser all the way back to our tap at the city main. So that was, let's see here. Three hundred and ninety five feet. Then you add your fittings in here. So gate, T, that was four inch. So you can see here, all our sizes aren't what we denoted previously. So what we can do is we can replace those backwards. Two inch, okay. Actually, we'll replace these forward. Oops, sorry. Two inch. C 
See there, got all those replaced. Then the cross mains, we had a four inch. So now we went up to schedule four with a, or a schedule 40 with those. So you put in B, which is our pipe tables of schedule 10. Then we're actually gonna add our backflow in here. B, backflow in, backflow out. Oops. Put those both at negative four. So we'll actually change this to backflow out. Add our branch lines. So backflow out to backflow in. Change this to a fixed pressure loss, negative four. We can break this out, so backflow in to 40. Change this to SRC, it sticks out a little bit better. So 195, whoops, 195. One ninety five. And this was PVC. Can't remember our page table for that, so we're just going to leave it at six. Six. We'll click calculate. You can see here, here's our sprinklers gonna peak for those areas. So this is one side of the cross main or a gridded system. Here's the other side. Minimum flow of 24. Oops, entered those in backwards. So you just flip them around. There you go. Now we've quickly calculated our system. So pressure available is 39 PSI greater than the required pressure. So you see you can get a better estimate by quickly using one of our system builders. and It'll be more accurate. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me at HRS Systems. My email is russ at HRS Systems. Thank you.